Hello, everyone. My name is Dragos Chobanu. I am the program manager for the MA in Applied Translation Studies program at the University of Leeds. I'm based in the Center for Translation Studies. And I am very grateful to my colleague, Professor Jeremy Monday, as well as to the conference organizers for inviting me to share a few ideas about the future of the human technology interface in the translation sector. My background is in languages, in translation studies, as well as in the industry. I used to work as an in-house translator and technical writer before coming to Leeds to do a PhD in computer assisted language learning, as well as starting to work on a number of EU funded projects um, whose focus was CAT tools, CAT tools training, uh, the influence of these technologies on uh, professional translators. Um, this is a wordle from my blog and if you are interested, um, you can read about translation, about corpus linguistics, about all kinds of technology, as well as about e-learning, because I also have experience in this area. And this is uh, an up and coming, especially in the translation um, and localization industry. It's an up and coming um, field of study. If you would like to continue the conversation after this presentation, or perhaps at the end of the conference, please be in touch. Uh, my Twitter handle is at eLearningBakery. And if you're also curious to see the kinds of things that we do in the Center for Translation Studies, please follow hashtag LeedsCTS on Twitter as well. I was very excited to hear about the topic of, of your conference, um, the East-West communication in the era of Lingua Franca, because only last week I was in Sheffield attending a conference on English as a Lingua Franca. This conference was organized by the Worldwide Universities Network, and it was a really fascinating opportunity to talk to colleagues from all over the globe, literally, about English medium instruction, how it's implemented, as well as about the influence that English has on local languages. And I'm sure you, you have already uh, started to discuss this and you will continue to discuss um, this really interesting topic uh, throughout the conference. The presentation that I have prepared um, is quite colorful and it has a lot of images. Um, so I hope it will be um, interesting uh, for you. So I start by um, showing you a, uh, an image taken last year at the conference that I co-organized at the University of Leeds. And I've chosen this image uh, to start with in order to um, bring together the theme of the conference in uh, English as a lingua franca or uh, the search for a lingua franca and my personal interests which are technology uh, mediating communication and ensuring that information reaches uh, a wide um, audience and in this image you can see we have presenters in a conference setting an international conference the presenters have their slides on the screen but there is also one palantypist who uses a palantype, which is a special keyboard, in order to produce a live transcript, which is broadcast on the second uh, screen um, for, for all the participants to see. And you can see here how English is used as the lingua franca at this particular conference. And you can also imagine how um, the participants for whom English is not the mother tongue will benefit from having both the audio and the visual uh, channels um, bringing information to them. And you can also think that the, the deaf or the hard of hearing participants also have access uh, to the information. Uh, we have one conference participant who has his own screen. Um, we're looking at the same live transcript, but in a bigger font. And uh, this is because he was uh, hard of hearing, but also because he had a severe visual impairment. So uh, this screen enhances uh, the, the font size and also allows him to engage with the information. And last but not least, we also have in the room a British sign language interpreter who is working with a client who finds it a lot more, uh, a lot easier um, to communicate via sign language rather than read um, the information on the screen. So you can see here how People together with technology uh, are brought together in order to offer access to information to, to a very wide audience. Now, having lingua francas and 
English in particular um, can be quite problematic for local languages. And this is a page from the website of the Académie Française where the, the, the website lists a number of words whose um, origin was uh, not French, um, but also they, um, the, the Academy has a list of terms for which there are um, French equivalents, um, but it seems that in, in normal use, in everyday use, the English terms um, tend to become more and more popular. And the Académie Française is taking active steps to encourage uh, the French speakers to use the native French terms rather than um, go for the perhaps more popular, um, more trendy English equivalents. So I'm sure they, this debate um, has already been touched on at the conference and will continue to be so. And this is not an isolated case. Um, there are other countries throughout the world whose official bodies are taking active steps to protect the, the local language against the influence of uh, lingua francas. Now, English used to be the lingua franca of technology, but is that still the case? And this is a screenshot of my own um, Windows operating system, which keeps prompting me to install additional language packs. Um, so if I uh, wanted to have my whole operating system and my whole, whole computer experience in my own language, um, then perhaps um, that language was represented um, in the language packs available. Um, at the moment, uh, as you can see, there are only 31 suggestions for me. Um, but I'm sure Microsoft is working uh, on more. And this is part of the, the recent drive to reach the, a wide audience by speaking in their own language. And I'll mention the Common Sense Advisory um, reports in a while, but this is very relevant, especially considering one of their latest reports, which is called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Can't Read, Won't Buy. So the idea is that if you want to, to uh, win the hearts and minds of uh, your target audience, you have to speak their native language. This got me thinking about CAT tools, computer-assisted translation tools. Do they use English as a lingua franca or do they try and appeal to a wider audience by having their interfaces localized in other languages as well? And the answer is that indeed they are um, quite active in the field of localization. So for instance, MemoQ, which is um, one of the more recent but extremely popular and uh, powerful CAT tools available, um, MemoQ has uh, the interface in English, but also the option to switch to perhaps a German interface or a Spanish one or so on um, if, if the user actually needs it. Um, I then went uh, one step further and I was wondering, okay, what would such an interface look like on my own machine? So I opened up uh, SDL Trader Studio 2014 and I changed the user interface to Chinese. And as you can see, quite a lot of the menus are now in Chinese and some of them are not displayed well because I'm trying to run this, uh, well, I'm actually running this um, CAT tool on my Windows machine, which is on, a, on an English locale. So there are some conflicts there, but as you can see, it is quite possible. And uh, I'm sure the Chinese speakers will find it uh, quite useful to have such software in their own uh, language, particularly since we are talking as of uh, CAT tools. And finally, this is another example from Deja Vu X3, which is the latest version of Deja Vu. Um, you can see the interface in Russian, but again, if you want to or you need to uh, change the interface language into something else, um, Deja Vu offers you a few options. So all of this uh, localization used to be um, believed to be wizardry, something extremely complicated and people tended to stay well away from it. But actually, as a matter of fact, it's not that complicated. Um, with good software design, you can actually have a, quite a smooth localization process. And one of the exercises that our students do and one of the pieces of software that they look at throughout their MA in Applied Translation Studies deals exactly with software localization. So students would start from quite a, a popular 
um, application. So in this case, I'm sure uh, quite a few of you are familiar with Solitaire. And they would import that application into a software localization tool. And the advantage of using the software localization tool is that in addition to the source text, which is automatically extracted, and the target text, which the localizer can type in, the software localization tool also allows the, um, the translator to <coughs> excuse me, um, to maximize or resize windows and text boxes in order to create a, uh, a complete uh, product uh, and a product which works on a variety of levels, not just linguistic, but also um, aesthetic. At the end of this um, seamless process, you get a fully localized version of the original application. And these are just some of the languages that our students in the Center for Translation Studies cover. Um, and you can see that it's no longer wizardry. It is very possible with the help of technology. So I cannot really stress enough how important technology is. And this idea comes back time and time again whenever we talk to um, our partners in the industry, the companies, the software providers, and even the international organizations such as the UN and the EU, with whom we have a, a very good uh, working relation. The Common Sense Advisory uh, releases regular reports about the status of the market and the importance of technology and the influence of technology. So I'm sure some of you are already familiar with, uh, with this website, but for those who are not, I highly recommend uh, you check it out and see what the, the latest uh, studies indicate. Now, in the past, talking about CAT tools, things used to be quite straightforward. So the professional um, translators would work in their preferred um, text editing environment, um, they might have a few additional toolbars and they might have the, the help of a translation memory or some terminology um, as well. And that was pretty much it. It was quite limited and it, therefore CAT tools were left to just for the business sector, for the professionals. However, what I will try to argue today is that at present the CAT tools have become so competent and so powerful that actually there is a valid place for them in the training sessions that we run. And it's not just the specialized CAT tool sessions, but also in the translation sessions as well. And I will demonstrate uh, why. So first of all, a CAT tool nowadays looks something like this. Um, it extracts uh, the source text and presents it in a column. Um, in this case, MemoQ uh, presents it on the left-hand side, but you can also change the layouts. And it allows the translator to type in, um, in on the right-hand side in this example. So this is me translating into Romanian. The CAT tool identifies terminology, which already exists in any terminology databases attached to the project, and suggests um, possible translations from a translation memory or from local terminology database or from global terminology database or from um, machine translation engines as well. In addition, and very similar to the software localization tools, um, the latest CAT tools also offer previews. So you can see your translation in context. And this uh, goes quite a long way to address some of the challenges and resistance that um, used to, um, to be raised uh, against CAT tools, uh, because you would just get a string of text. Well, nowadays you can actually see that text in context. Um, support for um, Chinese and Japanese and Korean used to be quite limited, but nowadays it's getting a lot better. The segmentation rules are better, so your source segments uh, will be extracted more accurately. And also you can change such uh, segmentation rules. So global support, Unicode support uh, is now embedded. In addition to um, translating and using translation memory um, results, you can also extract terminology with CAT tools and you can see which terminology was um, already translated in the database and you can filter out common words. So this is again another example of a valid task that um, can be embedded in the translation class. 
you can nowadays use in MemoQ uh, corpora. So beyond the bilingual texts that you can align with pretty much all the catalogs out there, with MemoQ you can also use multi um, monolingual corpora. So in this example, I have a, a big corpus of Romanian um, text on fair trade, as well as a big corpus of English uh, fair trade text. And I'm going to use these resources um, together in order to check both source and target um, equivalents and um, terminology and phrases. And this is something extremely useful, which now lives in one tool rather than you having to um, go outside and uh, work and find your own uh, resources. It's also extremely useful to have machine translation embedded in the CAT tools because um, whatever you might have heard about machine translation, in some contexts it can actually help an awful lot. And tools such as MemoQ and others embed uh, the, the established engines, for instance, Google MT and Microsoft uh, MT, but also the up and coming and very relevant uh, providers uh, such as Kantan or Let's MT. And it is um, a very useful exercise to see, to compare the quality of the MT engines and also to get the students used to using machine translation in appropriate contexts. There are other time saving and consistency um, enhancing features such as predictive text. So you can see here that as I'm typing, um, MemoQ is helping me. Um, with, well, by guessing what I'm going to type, and um, depending on the language resources I use, uh, this is actually very accurate. And another exercise which is very popular um, in training programs everywhere is to get professional translators familiar with uh, using concordances, using large corpora, and also with searching a lot of um, online databases. Well, now with MemoQ, you can actually do that from within the CAT tool. So rather than copying and pasting and maintaining a lot of um, open um, web browsers at the same time, you can now, from within MemoQ, highlight the, the phrase that you, you need to look up and then um, search some uh, built-in engines. Um, so for instance, Collins and Euroturn Bank and Google and Ayate they are predefined in MemoQ, but you can also um, configure your own. So for instance, in this example, I'm looking through the Leeds corpus interface. I'm searching uh, a particular corpus uh, for examples of fair trade. And so you can see how you can use such a functionality actively in your translation classes um, for consistency and also to ensure that the students are getting used to using a wide range of resources in their research um, while aiming for, for the best, uh, most adequate uh, translation for the given brief. Um, again, coming back to a translation workflow, it's very useful given the collaborative nature of translation nowadays to be able to add notes and various items of information to segments so that your team members can see and help you out. And it's also, extremely useful for reviewers to be able to use uh, a typology of errors consist consistently in order to indicate to the translator as well as to the project manager perhaps the kinds of errors that are identified and uh, their severity as well. So this is an example of the Melange error typology. Melange was another project that Leeds uh, were involved in and we created with our partners uh, an error typology and just to bring it up a little bit more. Um, we have categories and subcategories of errors, and then you can specify in MemoQ points to be deducted uh, depending on the severity. So you can see that this functionality can be very useful in the translation class, um, even for marking purposes, um, not just for um, research purposes. Um, so it's all very good that you can do all these things in the, in the CAT tool, but for me, the latest development, which is the most exciting, is the fact that I can now use voice recognition systems with CAT tools very effectively. And I'm very fond of my Bluetooth microphone because it allows me to 
roam around the room and just dictate uh, whatever I need to dictate. And at the top, you can see uh, the toolbar of Dragon, naturally speaking. And at the moment, I find that uh, freelance translators are using, are starting to use more uh, voice recognition systems, but the, the usage is still quite limited. Uh, it's restricted to just um, speaking your translations. And that's fine. It's a time saver and a lot of freelancers um, really appreciate not having to type and so therefore saving their fingers. However, um, I'm now in running a project where I'm looking at the influence of more of these functionalities on the use of professional, on the, on the practice of professional translators. And in particular, I am quite excited to have been able to turn the, the translation process using a CAD tool into more of an interpreting tool. So I was able to, for instance, um, set up the system so that my source text would be read out to me um, and I would be able to dictate my translation in the target area. And then I would also be able to ask the computer to read back my translation to me. So you can see how translation is getting a lot closer to interpreting. And I'm just very interested to see what professional translators think of, of this way of working and how, how they find it. Um, we already know that uh, spoken, um, the, the fact that one, the reviewer speaks out uh, the translation back to the translator is a very valid and effective uh, revision process. Um, but I'm just quite interested to see how addition, in addition to this, hearing the, the source um, as well, um, what, what kind of influence that has on the professional translator. Um, not only that, but you can also customize your own commands. And um, let's say you have some cat tool functionality, which you find particularly useful, but it's quite hidden away in some menus and it's not very easy to get to. You can actually, with the latest voice recognition tools, you can customize and just speak out the command rather than search for it in menus. So as you can see, I personally find there is a lot of potential, a lot of um, underuse um, of these latest technologies. And I'm very excited to see what my research project is going to bring up. If you're interested um, in trying dictation for yourselves and you have um, a wide range of languages, then perhaps you can also um, check out this uh, Dragon iPhone and iPad app, which covers a lot more languages than their desktop version. Apart from depending on technology more and more, the industry is also extremely collaborative nowadays. And at the Center for Translation Studies in my program, I work every year with partners all over the globe um, and I engage my students with students in other areas. So I've done projects with Tokyo, with Hong Kong, with several cities in Romania, uh, the University of Ljubljana as well, and other places in the UK where the students were working together, they were collabor uh, co collaborating, they were using different CAT tools, um, they were communicating, invoicing, getting used to quoting. Uh, so we were really simulating uh, an extremely real, well, uh, as, as real life as it could be, a uh, project for, uh, for our students uh, in order to make them much, much better professional translators when they graduate. And this was not just artificial simulation, but uh, very recently my students collaborated and they produced some of the the translations that you can see here for the World Fair Trade Day. So in under two days, um, thanks to a, an online collaborative environment, we were able to have our students work and our collaborators as well uh, in Ljubljana work together, produce really good translations, uh, which the World Fair Trade's own professional translators um, proofread and sent feedback on and then published on the website. So thanks to um, to technology and uh, the general openness um, to technology and the latest developments, the, the, the translation world is changing and it's also a lot easier to give access to information to a wider range, uh, a much bigger audience. So to end, um, I wanted to bring up four projects which you might find interesting. 
The first one is the Ecolore project, um, whose website was localized into several languages and which has interesting resources for teaching professional translators about CAT tools. The second one is the IntelliText project, which allows you to search through a wide range of corpora as well as build your own corpus and then use that in your research as well as in your translation work. Thirdly, Leeds was uh, the lead partner in the National Network for Interpreting. So if you are looking for English language interactive multimedia uh, resources which explain what interpreters do, then uh, this will be a good place to come to. And finally, ORCID is the follow-up from the National Network for Interpreting. It's an EU-funded project with resources aimed at teaching um, students what conference interpreting is all about, what skills you need, and you will also find that uh, some of these resources are available in several languages. So my two main messages for today were that, first of all, CAT tools are not just productivity tools. They are a lot more complex and they can be very useful in the language um, and translation classes as well. So they can be, I, I believe, at least some of them, uh, complete training tools. The second message I wanted to, uh, to get across is that there is scope for making much smarter use of available technologies. And I mentioned um, the voice recognition technologies in particular and how at the moment I feel that uh, their functionalities are, are very much underused. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been of interest and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you via email or on Twitter. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.